All right, listeners, I think you know that we are part of the Radiotopia Network, which is basically a network built on the idea that you should support the most creative, independent audio makers around. No one, and I mean no one, embodies the Radiotopia ethos more than Benjamin Walker and his show, Theory of Everything. Benjamin, who I've known for a long time, has been making beautiful, personal, sprawling audio documentaries for decades that help us understand the very strange world we live in. And now he has a new series called Not All Propaganda is Art. The new series goes back to the 1950s when Western security agencies like the CIA paid artists, writers, and intellectuals to fight the cultural Cold War. The CIA funds were free. I mean, no one was told what to say. Gloria Steinem, activist who sees the CIA as a sort of enlightened pal or rich uncle, there is another viewpoint. Look, if you're listening to this show, I know you like secret histories. I know you like a mix of culture and politics and shadowy figures. So what are you waiting for? Not All Propaganda is Art from Benjamin Walker. You can find it now wherever you listen or at theoryofeverythingpodcast.com. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, June 29th, 1909, the Wright brothers conduct test flights on their military flyer at Fort Myer, Virginia. The Wright brothers' military flyer, Fort Myer, say that 10 times fast. Um, Look, shout out to (laughs) listener Travis for suggesting this story. And it is a really interesting one because I think generally, if we think of the Wright brothers, we think of them as kind of independent inventors, uh, former bicycle shop owners who were tinkering away for years to finally basically build the first successful motor-operated airplane. And that's basically true, but in this moment, there's also this relationship developing and this ongoing relationship with the government. And the government is kind of finally coming around and saying, okay, fine, Wright Brothers, you did it. Now, let's talk. (laughs) Let's become partners. (laughs) So, here to discuss the moment when the Wright Brothers got a call from the military industrial complex. I don't think that I don't think that <laughs> phrase existed at that moment, but nevertheless they were um, creating here to, it. <laughs> exactly. Well yeah. Here to discuss, yeah. as always, Nicole Hammer of Columbia and Kelly Carter Jackson of Wellesley. Hello there. Hello, Jody. Hey there. And uh Kelly, this is a, an incredibly uh awkward segue but you can thank the Wright brothers for the your ability to have gotten on an airplane and gone to where you are now uh or maybe thank the military industrial complex but Ke- kelly where are you tell, tell That's everyone right i i'm in i'm in paris right now and it's interesting because the french were one of the first foreign governments to work with the Wright oh, brothers and help you know really take their technology to a new level so thank you france <laughs> yeah. and, and, and kelly is yeah you know, he's not just in france right now but you're living there this summer it's pretty awesome doing research for your next book so a yes. we wanted you give you a chance to brag about the fact that you're living in paris uh and b also if your mic sounds a little different you're close listeners out there that's why but anyway the power She's got a big of... stack of croissants behind yeah. her and <laughs> we're, we're and all very gets. jealous yeah. um but you know between the wright brothers and whoever invented zoom we are now able to do this podcast yes. so yes um all right uh i guess you know Let's go to what I mentioned in the intro. And, um, you know, Kelly, I know you have um, an aviation geek in your family and we were talking about this a little bit. But, you know, let's talk about the Wright brothers themselves, because I wrote that intro in many ways coming from my impression, which is really like they're these independent tinkerers. And so this idea of of that versus now all of a sudden sort of coming into the warm embrace of the government is, is really interesting. So what, what do we make of the Wright brothers as independence versus part of a larger complex? You know, they come from a small town in Ohio. They really are part of like small town America. Their father is a pastor. They're one of seven children. And they really take a deep dive, no pun intended, into into aviation, into really, you know, cultivating it, perfecting it in ways that other people just had not ever, you know, considered in this way. And so the Wright brothers are incredible because they are geniuses of their time. They are literally looking at old data, data that was written up in the 1700s by a man named George Kelly, And they're looking at his formulas for flight and aviation and saying, actually, his data is wrong. It's flawed. And then they're creating their own wind tunnels. They travel to North Carolina because a friend tells them that wind is actually better in North Carolina. So, <laughs> Make that the state motto. <laughs> the yeah, wind is better so that's here. How you get the, 
<laughs> so you get the dispute over like Ohio versus North Carolina for first in flight. But they go to North Carolina and do a lot of their um, tests and collection and then really continue to perfect it and have these patents about their ideas that really do change the game for how we think about uh, aviation. And not just the fact that they were able to fly, but the fact that they were able to stabilize their flight, like mm-hmm. get in the air, stay in the air, and then control that, um, control their speed and their height while they were flying is is pretty incredible. You know, that mention of patents, Kelly, does help to put the spotlight on the role that government has always played when it comes to innovation and invention in the United States. It's written in the Constitution, this patent process that allows for the particular types of innovations and the types of sort of intellectual property protections that innovators have and the role that the government plays then in deciding who the winners and losers are when it comes to the development of new technologies. Because what happens in the case of the Wright brothers is the the army puts out this call for some sort of heavier than air flying machine. And 41 people submit their ideas and Theodore Roosevelt kind of looks at them and he chooses the Wright brothers to produce a flying machine for the army. So the role of the government in elevating and shaping the way that aviation is going to develop in the United States is actually a a pretty big role. Yeah. Um, I get the impression that the government was a little knew knew who the Wrights were and knew that they were off in their bicycle shop Mm -hmm. tinkering and were maybe a little skeptical of them for a few years here. And then finally, kind of, there's a little bit of a moment. I don't know. I get the sense there's a little moment of a concession here, a little spurred by Teddy Roosevelt basically saying, you need to, you know, listen to these folks. Um, And so it's maybe a little begrudging on both sides um, to come to this moment. But clearly we see something that I think has gone on forever since and mm-hmm. pre- previously, which is, you know, that the military often has the resources and the desire to really push innovations. I think a lot of people don't realize is that in World War One, when the United States enters the war, they don't really have an acceptable American designed airplane available that the United States, they're using French machines because the French were the first to really work with the uh, Wright brothers more than any other group. And so the, you know, France has this, the UK has this, but the United States is behind and sort of um, using this technology. And so it really has to cut a deal with the Wright brothers in order to accelerate um, their ability to be able to participate in the war in a meaningful way using their own aircraft. And that brings up something pretty fascinating about the Wright brothers and their views of airplanes and war. They're being commissioned here by the army. So the idea that this has some sort of military application should be clear. But the way that the Wright brothers talked about it was that actually, if you introduce airplanes into the theater of war, what you're going to do is make war untenable. You won't be able Mm. to do sneak surprise attacks because people will be able to fly airplanes and see where different army battalions are located. And this is going to not just change the way of war, but it's going to eliminate war. And this is happening in this moment in the 1900s and 19-teens, where there is this real optimism about the idea that war can be uh, abolished, both Mm. because of a, a commitment to peace, but also because of new technologies and because the modern world no longer needs war, which is such an irony when you think about the way that airplanes ultimately do remake ways of war. Yeah, I think about that quote by um, Orville. He says this in 1917. He says, when my brother and I built and flew the first man carrying flying machine, we were introducing the world an invention that would further make wars practically impossible. So the idea that they were creating this machine was never a thought that it could be weaponized, that it could be used in war and cause catastrophic destruction. They would have never intended it for that. Um. And we see this, you know, the inventor of dynamite thought that, um, of course, <laughs> the no- that's Nobel and the Nobel Peace Prize, you know, was a sort of makeup for the invention of dynamite. Um, but yeah, we see all these sort of well-intentioned efforts. And, you know, maybe there was a understandable naivete at that point going before the war. Obviously, I think after the war, things had really changed. But I mean, what, World War One was what H.G. Wells called that the war to end all wars, right? Um, mm. And, you know, I think that there was really a sense that that, that was... Um, a possibility. Uh, 
now you look back at it and you're like, what did you expect? You know, of Thank course, her. all of these things are going to be thought of in a military context. I mean, everything now is thought of as how can this be weaponized? And in mm. fact, it's weaponized even before World War One. In 1911, there's an Italian pilot who's flying one of these observation missions, and he drops grenades over the sides of his yeah. plane during the Italo-Turkish War. And so it, it becomes a weapon of war very quickly. And then the justification kind of changes, and this was true for dynamite as well, that the these things are going to make war so horrible that people aren't going to fight wars anymore, which seems like a real misjudgment of human character. Yeah. Um, yeah. And certainly history bears that out. Yeah. Mm, yeah. I mean, I think the the common belief is to think of aviation in terms of, you know, getting from A to Z rather mm-hmm. quickly. The fact that we all fly planes to get to where we want to go for the most part. Yeah. Uh, we think of aviation in that way. We we don't think of it in the terms of the way that it was used as a weapon of warfare very early on. Um, the idea of like... Um, you know, American Airlines, United or Southwest, that that's a, a far afterthought. Um, and really as a product after World War II, that airlines now come into existence. Yeah. So coming back to our moment here in the summer of 1909, I guess, you know, in 08, when the military and the Wright brothers first start chatting, Roosevelt is president by summer of 1909. President Taft is in office and he's down at Fort Myer to watch this moment that we're marking here in late July. Um, they fly a test. The airplane had crashed a number of times, uh, <laughs> severely injuring Orville. Um, and this was in prior tests. And the military had nevertheless still said kind of like, we believe in this. We'll keep going. The first thing they do is they run a land test just to see how fast it can go. Um, and there's a lieutenant from the military as their passenger. And it averages 42.58 miles per hour over a distance of 44 miles. And the military has a $2,500 per mile over 40 miles per hour bonus, which is, you know, I don't know who their, um, who their agent was, but that was well negotiated. But it's 2500 bucks <laughs> for every mile over 40 miles per hour. And that provides enough incentive that by the later in the summer, the U.S. Army basically purchases its first military flyer um, for $30,000 from their rights. So it's really in that kind of fall 1908 through the summer of 1909 that this partnership really solidifies. And then the speed at which, so how to speak, um, the speed at which <laughs> these airplanes are improved and militarized, not just in through World War One, but then ongoing, is just kind of stunning the rate of yeah. progress. Yeah, I mean, if you look at this plane that's being flown in this test that wins the Wright brothers this contract, you know, 40 miles an hour, it's not fast. They're not that far (laughs) off the ground. And the plane looks like it's like toothpicks with a little bit of cloth on it. Like it (laughs) really is. it's, it's It's a pretty rickety looking thing but that's how how you start right you start with this very simple and very slow flying machine that as you were saying Jody you know 10 years later during world war 1 looks very very different and they, you know, they, the changes that get made are, are sort of rapid. And initially, when you think of the first airplane, it's really a glider. You know, mm-hmm. it, it glides for about nine minutes in air, which, you know, that was a record that was held for like 10 years when it first accomplishes that feat. And then, you know, they get the bright idea, let's add a motor to it, you know, and then the motor accelerates the speed. They also change the placement of the motor. So instead of putting the motor in behind and having the airplane being, you know, know, sort of uh, pushed by the motor, they decided to put the motor in the front and really pull the airplane through the sky. And so and that's a change that is still in existence today. All airplanes have their motors in the front of the airplane to pull the plane along. But you see that with each, you know, um, advancement, airplanes are getting faster, they're getting more agile, they're able to do things that we wouldn't have thought of in the in the past, um, even 10 years. Yeah. And you were telling us before we started taping that, you know, Nathaniel, your husband, who's a who's a pilot and knows this history, was just kind of pointing out the stunning progress in the course of 50, 60 years in aviation. Oh, yeah. He said um, he said, consider this, that we go from flying the first plane in 1903 to landing on the moon in 1969. So in about 66 years time, you have rapid transformation of aviation. You go from airplanes to rockets, essentially. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and as we wrap up, I mean, I do want to come back to the rights and their sort of vision for aviation, particularly in a military complex, because, you know, one thing I don't think I ne- necessarily realize is that they were alive to see much of those mm-hmm. changes that you pointed out, Kelly. I mean, they, they you know, yeah. Orville, right, I think died in the late 40s, uh, the very late 40s. But I mean, he sees World War One, he sees World War Two, and then he sees, you know, the rise of the atomic age. And I mean, throughout, yeah. he continues to basically say, you know, that the airplane will be our way to restore peace, even into World War Two. There's a letter he writes to Henry Ford, where he says that the airplane will be our, our way to restore peace to the world. In 1946, though, there's this interesting shift, I think, towards the end of his life, where he says, I once thought the airplane would end all wars. I now wonder whether the airplane and the atomic bomb can do it. And I thought that the military might have a use in the reverse to stop wars. Right. But, and then he says, and this is just a really sort of fitting incredible line but he says you know the men who start wars aren't the ones who do the fighting we'd Mm -hmm. hoped talking about him and his brother we'd hoped that the possibility of dropping bombs on capital cities would deter them then the years after hiroshima and nagasaki he's seen what has happened um he sees what his invention has wrought yeah and i think that it's such a it's such a fascinating point too this idea that well, the people who are organizing the wars, they're not the ones who are the victims of them. So they do the wars precisely because they can't be harmed by them. Um, but that is just, it's both falsified and not, right? Like, you don't often see the leaders of countries who are who are propagating wars um, being killed in them. Um, right. But that just, that faith that an innovation is going to stop wars, I think that's that's the fatal flaw in his logic. Yeah. yeah, even litigation didn't stop wars mm-hmm. because through all of these, you know, uh, patents, the the Wright brothers are not really innovating. In some ways, they get so caught up in litigation over protecting their patents that people are able to outdesign them because they're so protective of the designs that they've made. And so it's really like a Pandora's box. Once it's opened, there was no way for them to sort of um, stall the innovation that came, even though they were trying to protect their ideas and their concepts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, All right. As we wrap up, I do want to point out that we're talking about this moment in 1908. 2008 was a hundredth year anniversary of this flight. And no surprise, a lot of aviation nerds, I don't know if Nathaniel was part of this, you know, marked this moment. Yes. There were lots yes. of, uh, you know, <laughs> get togethers and symposiums and stuff and celebration of the Wright brothers, including um, someone by the name of Ken Hyde, who built an exact replica of the 1908 Wright military flyer. And, I haven't been able to fully run this down, but I did a little research this morning. I was trying to find it Um, because there's a quote where he says that he believes that it is flyable. But I don't see any evidence that he actually (laughs) tried to fly it, which I think tells you a little something of like, yes, I'll I'll build the replica. It is exactly the spec. And yes, I believe it's flyable. But no, I'm not actually going to get in that thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's so funny because I think this all the time because my husband is building his own plane. Yes. He's building an RV7. And I think about all the time, like, when it's actually done, are we really going to get in this? <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, for him, the answer is absolutely yes. Yeah. For me, uh, yeah. <laughs> no more on the fence. At least he's not. Yeah. At least he's not going back to 1908, right? Build your airplane yes, something yes. in the last 10 years. Why not? Yeah. Uh, this airplane will have an engine yeah. <laughs> and a GPS. Yeah. Good. Well, there you go. Um, all right. Well, that brings us to the end of the episode. Um, Nicole Hammer, thanks to you. Thanks, Jody. And Kelly Carter Jackson, thanks to you. My pleasure. Radio Tokyo.